Hello and welcome. My name is Julia Dobbins, and I am a project manager here at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Today's webinar, Responding to Intimate Partner Violence, Tools and Resources for HGH Staff, is a collaboration between Futures Without Violence and the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. With support from health, the Health Services, Health Resources and Services Administration. The topic of intimate partner violence is particularly relevant right now, not just due to recent political events, but also because October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We are thrilled to have three wonderful speakers with us today. Anna Mariavi, who joins us from Futures Without Violence. Chris Esperson, who is the past president of the Midwest Clinicians Network, and Brian Bickford, who is with Community Health Link. This is a 90-minute presentation with the last 15 minutes reserved for Q&A. Below the presentation slide, there is a chat box for participant questions and technical issues. Please type your questions or technical issues into the chat box at any time during this presentation. A selected number of questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. If you're having technical issues, you can also contact the Council's office at 615-226-2292 and speak with Lori Hopper. This webinar is being recorded and the PowerPoint presentation along with the recording of this webinar will be posted on our website within the next few business days. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Anna to start the presentation. Anna? Thank you, Julia, and we're so pleased to be partnering with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council on this webinar today, and my co-presenters, Chris and Brian, um, who are going to also have some really great wisdom for you in doing this work. Um, our work at Futures Without Violence is also funded by the Department of Health and Human Services. We operate the National Health Resource Center on Domestic Violence which is to say that we provide free technical assistance and materials to anyone who is interested in this topic. And here on the slide, you can see a sampling of the different kinds of tools that we offer, and I'm going to be talking more about those at the end as well. So intimate partner violence, what is it? Um, one person in a relationship is using a pattern of methods and tactics to gain and maintain power and control over the other person. I really want to emphasize the power and control element to it. It usually um, is something that goes on over time. It doesn't exist just once. It doesn't happen one time and then go away. Um, the cycle often compounds over time. And leaving an, uh, an abusive relationship is not always the safest for a person, sometimes the safest thing for them is staying in the relationship um, until they can do the right safety planning and they have the right support around them to, uh, to make a safe exit. Actually, leaving the relationship is the most dangerous time for people when they're most likely to be injured or killed. In terms of the definitions of domestic violence, you know, there's a legal definition which is much more narrow, um, you know, in terms of what constitutes a misdemeanor or a felony. However, a public health definition is much broader, and we're going to be talking about intimate partner violence and domestic violence within this broader public health lens, which really looks at emotional abuse, social isolation, stalking, intimidation, and threats. And when we look at homeless women in particular and physical and sexual abuse, we see some very alarming and high prevalence statistics. One study in Massachusetts found that upwards of 92% of homeless women that they surveyed had experienced severe physical or sexual assault at some point in their lifetime. And we compare this um, to mainstream statistics of women where um, for domestic violence, one in four women experience DV across their lifetime. So 92% is incredibly high. Looking at that, 63% were victims of violence by an intimate partner. And 43% of women in this study reported sexual abuse in childhood. And that's really significant because compared to women um, who have housing, that sexual abuse in childhood um, goes down to 24.6%. So it's to say that many women who are homeless not only have higher experiences of domestic violence, but many also experience um, childhood sexual abuse. And then when we look at um, another uh, a cross study of domestic violence and homelessness, and there's a lot of um, 
text on this slide, but I want to highlight that in these studies of women either in shelters or other um, domestic violence um, homeless programs, from it's either from one in three to one in two women said that they were homeless because of domestic violence. And so many women leave uh, when they're exiting domestic violence situations, um, they become homeless. It's one of the leading causes of homelessness for women. And they also experience domestic violence when they're homeless, you know, when they're living on the street or couch surfing or, you know, in other temporary um, situations, their rates of domestic violence are also increased there. And I also want to point out with these statistics that they're um, derived from women who are in shelters. However, it doesn't include women who are more hidden um, homeless. For example, people who are couch surfing or staying with friends. So these stats could actually be even higher than they are. And when we look at homeless women and children, it's estimated that half of all homeless women and children have become homeless while trying to escape abusive situations. So again, it's, um, it's an often um, present outcome um, when women and women and children are fleeing domestic violence situations. One of the implications can be that they no longer have housing. There's no secure shelter for them. Um, and there's a limitation in terms of beds that are available for women and children. Um, I was talking about earlier the early childhood um, sexual assault experiences um, of women. And it's just to say also that homeless women often report multiple episodes of violent victimization at the hands of multiple perpetrators beginning in childhood and extending into adulthood. So that, you know, traumatic incidents such as sexual assaults are really layered upon ongoing traumatic conditions. Um, including um, struggling to meet basic survival needs, um, living with ongoing dangers and threats. Um, and so that the, the trauma can really be compounded. Um, and it's important to think broader than just domestic violence. There may be um, other earlier childhood experiences of family violence or sexual abuse um, in terms of the trauma that, that homeless women have experienced. This um, next slide talks about ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. This is a study that really has um, gained a lot of recognition across the field of domestic and sexual violence. If you're not familiar with it, I have a little hyperlink on the bottom of the slide, and I would suggest um, taking a look at that five-minute primer video. I don't have too much time to get into it, but I just want to highlight a couple things. Um, the, the Adverse Childhood Experiences looked at you know, the kinds of experiences that people had growing up, such as physical, sexual, and verbal abuse in the home, neglect, having family members who are depressed or in jail, witnessing their mother being abused. And it's just to say that adverse childhood experiences are very common, and they've been connected to the onset of chronic disease, such as cancer and heart disease, later in life. So the more ACEs that you have, the more of these adverse childhood experiences, the greater your risk is for other chronic diseases, mental illness, and also being a victim of violence yourself. Um, so there's been some very compelling research done, um, really that shows that the early experiences that we have, those adverse experiences, really impact our health later in our lives. And that as we're addressing you know, um, our lives, our, our health as adults in terms of chronic conditions that we're facing, it's really important that providers um, are able to have conversations about how these early experiences or current violence that they're experiencing in their lives are exacerbating or impacting the chronic health issues that they're facing. And drawing those connections can often be um, very helpful for patients themselves um, in terms of really recognizing you know, what's going on um, physically, emotionally in their lives and giving them an opportunity to look a little bit differently at um, some of the healing um, and, and, and wellness that they're trying to achieve in terms of addressing some of that earlier violence. When we look at sexual assault nationally um, among women, one in five women in the U.S. has been raped at some point in their lives and half of them have reported being raped by an intimate partner. 
And even though these, this stat right here is, is alarming, you know, one in five, we, we know that it's also low, that many people don't report um, for various reasons. And um, sexual violence, you know, is an often present dynamic of domestic violence. It happens, you know, in dating relationships, it happens in marriages, and it's often one of the hardest things for survivors to talk about. Um, and again, there's that low reporting. So just to know within homeless populations um, and women living on the street, the statistics are even higher in terms of their experiences with sexual violence. We know that women who do not have children with them are at particularly high risk for sexual violence after the age of 18. And one of the reasons why is because, in part, um, they're more likely to sleep outside than are women with children who might fear for their children's well-being or worry about the interve intervention of Child Protective Services. Looking at that second bullet, compared to their low-income housed counterparts, the sexual assault experiences of homeless women are more likely to be violent and to include multiple sex acts. And the last, in one study, 13% of homeless women reported having been raped in the past 12 months, and half of these were raped at least twice. Um, people definitely don't undermine if, if you're working with a client and they're expressing fear, if there have been threats, 
you know, you need to take those very seriously. And um, one of the best supports for people is working with an advocate to do that necessary safety planning. Fear of safety if they try to leave. Again, we just talked about the, um, you know, homelessness. Um, one of the primary outcomes of, of women and children leaving a domestic violence situation. Money, security, it's not safe to leave. As I said at the beginning, sometimes the safest thing is to stay in the relationship. And Taylor said it is usually more dangerous to leave. So these are all really good points. Um, and I think overarching, you know, sometimes there's the love that someone has for that person, the memory of how things once were. Maybe they have children together and a desire, you know, to, to, to find, to go back to that place um, uh, you may love the person but hate the behavior. Can you go down here? And just scrolling through a few more of the comments. They may not know how to get out. Um, that's a really good point that Nakia made. There can be um, a lot of isolation, and that can be a tactic of a perpetrator restricting someone from seeing their family, or maybe they're isolated rurally, and there's fewer resources there for them. Um, the father may have been aggressive with the mother, so they are used to that. Undocumented, that's a great point. Um, undocumented or immigrants may have increased barriers to, to leaving. Um, staying because of their children and wanting their children to have a father. These are all really good points. And one of the you know, primary barriers, and obviously with, with many of you on the phone here that have, um, you know, that work with, with homeless clients and home, homeless populations, it's housing. The lack of emergency or transitional shelter is a huge barrier and a, and a primary reason why people stay, especially in you know, urban environments where the rents are just so incredibly high these days. There's a lot of reason um, why people stay. Um, someone brought up the undocumented challenges, you know, people who are immigrants are undocumented, and there are some unique considerations, um, some controlling behaviors that people may experience um, in domestic violence situations when they are undocumented or they're immigrants, threats of deportation, threats of taking their kids outside of the U.S., um, forbidding them from learning English, and using that language privilege over them, holding on to their important documents or telling them falsehoods about um, what will happen to their status you know, if they leave. And so just to let you know, the National Hotline on Domestic Violence is available 24-7 for your clients. There's the 800 number there on the screen. And they also use the language line. So if you're working with a client and there's a language barrier, um, you, know, you can you still use the hotline and they can use the language line to address um, some of those um, language barriers, but also some of these cultural considerations. And there are also some increased barriers to accessing services for women of color, lesbians and bisexuals, and women that have physical, emotional, or developmental disabilities. They face even greater barriers to accessing services. Part of that is because of institutional racism um, and other system um, issues where people don't feel comfortable or they're worried about what may happen, for example, with their children. Um, the second bullet, those who are mothers must take care of their children in chaotic situations while under the scrutiny of a range of social service providers and shelters, food pantries, and other settings. And so, you know, it's no wonder then that homeless women are at, at high risk for state involvement in their parenting and the potential removal of their children. And that sometimes restricts their own um, ability you know, to seek out social service support because of that fear of having their children removed. We talked at the beginning of the often um, present experience that homeless women have of earlier sexual abuse or earlier violence from a number of different perpetrators across their lifetime. Something else um, to recognize is that there's historical, cultural, and intergenerational that all of us um, you know, have encountered in different ways. So, you know, cultural trauma, um, an attack on the fabric of a society, experiences with 9-11 as an example, um, historical trauma for Native Americans, African Americans, the historical trauma that came from 
um, colonization, from racism, from slavery, um, all of that lasting living legacy um, for many people. And intergenerational trauma, when there's been, you know, across families, you know, different generations of violence or dysfunction, um, abuse, where it's been a continuous cycle. And so we've talked a lot about different kinds of dynamics of abuse and violence, and we're going to segue now into a video that talks about something called reproductive coercion. Some of you may have heard about this. It may be new to others. Um, we're going to learn a little bit more about it. It's an often hidden dynamic of domestic violence, but it's very prevalent is what we found. And the video will tell you a little bit more about it, and then we'll reconvene. It's about three minutes. And we'll run that. Making the Connection, an integrated response to intimate partner violence and reproductive coercion, is an innovative educational series created by Futures Without Violence. While the term reproductive coercion is relatively new to the field, the connection between violence and poor reproductive health outcomes has been well documented across disciplines for the past 25 years. Reproductive coercion involves behaviors that a partner uses to maintain power and control in a relationship related to reproductive health. Dynamics include birth control sabotage, pregnancy pressure, and pregnancy coercion. Birth control sabotage is active interference with a contraceptive method by someone involved in an intimate or dating relationship with an adult or adolescent. Dynamics include hiding or destroying birth control pills, intentionally breaking condoms, and removing contraceptive rings or patches against her will. Pregnancy pressure involves behaviors that are intended to pressure a partner to become pregnant when she does not want to be pregnant. These behaviors may be verbal or physical threats or a combination of both. Examples of pregnancy pressure include, I'll hurt you if you don't become pregnant, and I'll leave you if you don't become pregnant, and pregnancy coercion which involves threats or acts of violence if a woman does not comply with the perpetrator's wishes regarding the decision of whether to continue or terminate the pregnancy. Multiple representative studies demonstrate that at least one in four women has experienced sexual or physical violence at the hands of her partner. In family planning settings, prevalence rates are even greater. In fact, the incidence of physical and sexual violence can double. As many as a quarter of women coming to family planning clinics report that they have experienced reproductive coercion. By defining reproductive coercion, we have a lens to understand this very specific and common form of abuse. This knowledge transforms the role of healthcare providers and the way in which they can help women prevent unwanted pregnancies and STIs and promote their safety. Recent evidence has shown that a brief intervention for reproductive coercion reduces the likelihood of pregnancy coercion by 71%. Women who received the intervention were 60% more likely to end a relationship because it was unhealthy or unsafe. In this series of modules, we will show examples of ways providers can address reproductive coercion, providing language, tools, and techniques for effective intervention, changing the standard of care, and in doing so, changing women's lives. So as you heard in that video vignette, and this is um, a video that we produced at Futures Without Violence, and um, that is available to each of you, it's on our YouTube channel, um, women who disclosed abuse were at increased risk for rapid repeat and unintended pregnancy, and that's um, two pregnancies within 24 months of each other. Um, increased incidence of low birth weight babies, preterm birth, and miscarriages. Let's stay on that for a sec. And um, so, you know, reproductive coercion is really common. People's experience with birth control sabotage, people tampering, you know, with their pills or pulling out, um, you know, other kinds of contraceptive or restricting them from using condoms, you know, when they want to is really common. Um, as we saw from, from that video. And it's actually something that not all women are familiar with. It can be sort of an aha moment 
when a provider is able to acknowledge the dynamic and just talk about um, how common it is. Women um, often are able to see their situation just a little bit differently to know that, for that to be named and called out. Um, and that there are some interventions in terms of reduce, reducing um, the risk that can be helpful to her. So for example, offering an IUD with the strings cut off or maybe the patch um, if she's open to that. Um, and, and also just um, letting her know that something like emergency contraception, you know, she can keep that at home. Um, that might be uh, very helpful to her if she um, is, you know, forced to do things sexually she doesn't want to do or restricted from using birth control. She at least has that as a backup. And in terms of health impact, we know that women who are sexually assaulted by their intimate partners are much more likely to experience a range of health impact, from chronic health, um, chronic headaches and backaches, to chronic stress-related problems, um, IBS, hypertension. It certainly can impact your mental health, um, your feelings on yourself in terms of your self-esteem, depression, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and then a range of gynecologic issues from pelvic pain to STIs uh, to unintended pregnancies. And I just want to repeat that um, sexual assault is often the most difficult, um, most difficult issue for women to talk about, especially within the context of domestic violence. So as if, for those of you on the phone, if you're reproductive health providers and you're seeing um, you know, a range of these kinds of health issues presented, um, you, know, you may want to think about the relationship they're in or the kind of sex they're having. Do they have um, agency to use um, birth control if they want to? Uh, do they have agency to say when and how um, sex happens? Um, and to have those kinds of conversations, sometimes you don't always have to talk about rape or sexual assault. Sometimes it can just be more, the conversation can be more about, um, you know, do you have, can you decide, do you, you know, who decides when sex happens? Do you have a voice in terms of saying, you know, if and when, you know, sex happens? And, and, and just starting a more open conversation about people's experiences because it can be very hard for people to just specifically name rape or to talk about sexual assault. Um, but I think you can talk about it in a more nuanced way in terms of the kinds of issues that they're presenting with and the dynamics that they're facing. And when we look at sexual violence and homeless women, um, we know that homeless women who experience sexual assault may suffer from a range of emotional and physical challenges. So looking at one study, with homeless women who have been victimized, um, most participants reported mental health problems ranging from suicide attempts, almost one out of two people, depression, alcohol and drug dependence, and um, PTSD. And in terms of alcohol or drug dependence, you know, within domestic violence, Sometimes people are forced or coerced into using, um, you know, drugs or alcohol with their partners. And for those of you who work with adolescents, it's important to note that adolescent girls who um, are in physically abusive relationships are three and a half times more likely to become pregnant than non-abused girls. So it's incredibly important if you're working with young women um, who are experiencing dating violence, um, other kinds of abuse um, that you um, not only are able to talk about what's going on, what a healthy relationship looks like, you know, what what resources resources are available to them within their unhealthy relationships, but also to think about um, birth control. Again, the reproductive coercion piece. Can they use birth control? Um, are condoms an option? Is something like an IUD appropriate for them? And again, emergency contraception can really be, I think, a very important tool, a very important aid for women across the lifespan who are being um, sexually assaulted or experiencing domestic violence in an ongoing way, especially for women who are homeless or, um, you know, uh, have temporary housing that they may have even uh, less access to long-term um, uh, birth control or condoms, and so this might be a really critical 
aid for them as well, something that they can take home or take with them um, and keep should they need it. We're going to hear more about the health impact of abuse from Chris. I'm going to pass it over. And at the end of the webinar, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the resources that are available through our National Health Resource Center on Domestic Violence. Chris? Thank you so much, Anna. Let me back up a minute. Um, so and I also want to thank the National Health Care for the Homeless for producing this webinar on a topic. And it's ironic, it needs more national attention, even though it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, as was mentioned earlier. So our programs and our clinics operate in very busy and sometimes chaotic environments that can be wearing on our employees. In addition to self-care, one of the best activities we regularly did to ground ourselves and remind ourselves why we got into this work was to share patient stories. And that's what I'm going to do now. So Lindsay was a single mother. She met John. And he proceeded to sweep her off her feet. Uh, he was really romantic and attentive. And a fairy tale relationship ensued. So they moved in together. A few months down the road, John got Lindsay pregnant using the tactics very similar to the video you just saw. And not long after she became pregnant, he started to change. His questions weren't so innocent. They were probing and accusatory. Playful slights became more stinging and insulting. When Lindsay questioned the change, John told her that she must be sensitive because of her condition. And by that, he meant her pregnancy. The behavior escalated, escalated into physical violence and attempts on Lindsay's life. After the birth of her child, Lindsay abandoned her home, and she and her children found themselves homeless. So people like Lindsay experience a number of adverse health consequences, uh, very similar to the sexual assault uh, consequences that Anna has talked about. Uh, but these health consequences are due to the domestic violence. For su survivors of intimate partner violence, or IPV, injuries are common and include broken bones, bruises, scrapes, cuts, gunshot wounds, strangulation marks, and broken teeth. And these physical injuries cause visible reminders of the pain and can also result in chronic pain issues. Other neurological problems caused by IPV such as migraines, central nervous system problems, stroke, vision impairment, hemorrhaging, and severe brain injury. Reproductive and general issues are also commonly considered. Women who experience IPV are at higher risk for cervical cancer, HIV, gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia. Infections and injury include vaginal and anal tearing, urinary tract and vaginal infections, and physically and emotionally painful sexual intercourse. All of these things your providers must be aware of when assessing and treating patients. But many don't make that link between the abuse and chronic disease. Hypertension, heart disease, IBS, ulcers, asthma, heart attacks also result from intense stress and lack of health promoting factors such as social support. And of course, mental health conditions such as PTSD, anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation that's going to be a result of the abuse and the constant fear that our victims are enduring. Substance and alcohol abuse also occur and can be a result of either self-medicating or coping mechanisms, or their batterers could be forcing their victims to use. So let us know in the Q&A box, have you seen other impacts in your setting, and do your staff understand these impacts? Uh, I just lost my connection. <laughs> I don't know if someone can advance my slides. Um, I'll just let you know next slide when, when it ensues. OK, so from Lindsay's story, you might have, we're on the social term of the health slide right now. From Lindsay's story, you might have started thinking about how IPV is an adverse social determinant of health. And as it usually affects an individual's life where she lives, works, plays, learns, and worships. She can suffer from lost income due to missed work or her batter's interference with her work life. She may be so isolated from her support system by being restricted from contact with her family, friends, or place of worship. And of course, the main social determinant of health of the population we serve, she could experience homelessness as a result of IPD. So if someone is controlling my slides, can they move on to the next slide? And then we're going to talk about the impact on others. So although the victim experiences the harshest consequences, other people can also have negative incomes associated with IPV. 
Stress can cause adverse birth outcomes such as low birth weight, and that can have long effects on children, and abuse can sometimes result in the death of the fetus. Children face an increased risk of psychological, social, and behavioral problems such as mood and anxiety disorders, PTSD, and substance abuse. They can have problems at school which further exacerbate other problems. As adults, people who are exposed to IPV in childhood are more likely to experience violent dating and intimate relationships as adults with other victims or perpetrators. There are also huge economic costs to society. In the Q&A box, you can let us know other impacts you have seen. Um, you can even include that, those that have occurred with your staff or any other experiences you would like to share. So um, we are having a nice little storm where I'm at. So whoever is, I'm hoping someone's advancing my slides to the day in the life slide. Um, instead of embodying a healthcare worker right now, go ahead and picture yourself as a victim of an intimate partner violence. Think about the places you may go on a typical day, such as visiting friends, to school as an attendee or to drop off little ones, family members' houses, places that you go for your hobbies, work, your church or your mosque or your temple, and to the grocery store, or perhaps to community agencies to access services. Also think about the, the wheel of power and control and how some of these places may start off to be, become limited as the batter assumes more and more control. Health organizations may be the only place you can legitimately go without question or suspicion, and ironically, or perhaps not so ironically, are the only places required to ask the question, do you feel safe at home? That is why asking this question consistently, asking it in the right way, and following up is so vitally important. Picture yourself in this kind of isolating environment and how the question asked thoughtfully in a non-rush manner and out of genuine concern could impact your life. So I, I think that one of the attendees also talked about um, men can be victims of and partner violence. And there's these other kinds of dynamics that occur when men experience abuse. So it's really important to screen this in screening as well. So if someone can advance my slide to what this means for screening. In our environment, this means we need to consider our workflows and the intent of screening. We have so many things we are required to do in primary care and in our homeless programs. It seems that things keep on getting added onto the pile and nothing is ever taken away. But in the transition healthcare is undergoing and moving to improve patient outcomes, if we get the screening right, we contribute to those improved outcomes. This means that we need to be consistent in our screening processes. We need to do the screening right instead of treating it like a checkbox. And we need to work on improving our follow-up until we get it right. What are your barriers to screening effectively for IPV? Uh, feel free to type them in the Q&A box. And I really wish I could see them right now. But again, I have no internet. So please advance my slide to what this means for screening. So we had our own barriers. And we knew we had to do a better job. Uh, consistency, doing appropriate screening, and follow-through. These were our goals of the process improvement initiative to improve the way we address intimate partner violence. We wanted to ensure we were screening every patient when they came in for a visit. We had many discussions, some of them heated about how often. Some wanted to do it once a year and call it good, and others understood the importance of consistent screening. We finally reached consensus and we did the right thing, which was to screen all of our patients at every visit. Our measure of success was the percent of patients screened, and we measured this on a monthly basis by site. A huge issue in tracking our success was our OB visits. We were not sure if this was occurring because OB visits were documented in the system not linked to our EMR. I'm not sure if any of you have similar sites to that where not everything is, is immediately put in your EHR. So we had to do more PDSAs around this. This was a, was a very, very important population to screen for domestic violence. And it was complicated as well since a significant portion of this population were immigrants or refugees, and they all had limited English proficiency. So if you can go on to my next um, screening slide, please. Uh, another goal was to improve the way we screened our clients. So some of our staff knew it could take up to five times of asking the question before a victim was willing to admit to being abused. Others thought asking the question was a waste of time because no one ever said yes. 
uh, I was an EMR super user, and this was really an enlightening experience for me because I got to see how people were asking questions. The most frequent mistake was asking the consumer while the computer was in the SAS space or line of sight. Most concerning was when the question was asked in a flippant or judgmental manner. One time I watched in disbelief while a nurse asked the patient if she felt safe at home while prompting that patient by nodding her head yes. And then she followed up by asking if she felt down or depressed while shaking her head no. A lot of our PDSAs were around cultural competency and knowing how to get accurate answers when abusers attended visits with their victims. The great part about this is that our staff had a lot of wonderful answers. The nurses and the MAs especially found a number of so-called tests or urinalysis or something they needed to do with women alone in another room. Um, so that way she was able to get away from the potential abuser when they asked the safety question. So our measure of success for this element was the percent of people who screened positive, and our baseline was less than half a percent. Uh, this is very different than the numbers that Anna highlighted earlier, um, so we know that we weren't screening appropriately. So what are your thoughts on better measures of success or other things we could have focused on? Uh, please type any of your thoughts into the Q&A box. Um, another thing that you can be thinking about is when you're doing your competencies, this is another thing to do competencies around. All right, so if you can go on to my last slide for what this means for screening. Uh, we needed to have systems in place. Um, there you go. I got my internet back now. Yay. Uh, so uh, we needed to have those systems in place that we could rely on when someone does screen positively. This is where we started, even before we broadly educated staff on how to screen appropriately, because we really wanted to ensure that we had a workflow that would be supportive and effective when a consumer decided to confide in us. So think about who in your organization, or even in your community, can appropriately follow up. How will you do the handoff? We used radios and a secret word. And when inevitably one of our staff uh, who did that follow-up was not available, we checked with the patient preferences as far as waiting for someone, referring to a community partner, or um, what our options were to follow up with that patient. Safety planning was emphasized, and we focused on language that would not re-victimize our patients. So Lindsay, for example, had a history of IPV in the chart, um, that patient we discussed earlier. Years later, she went in for a legitimate non-IPV injury. And when she was rescreened and confirmed that IPV was no longer an issue, she had left her abuser, um, still the staff threatened to take her children away if she was lying. So we really do not want our patients and our consumers experiencing that. Um, for this uh, particular initiative, our measure of success was the number of patients who were screened or successfully followed up in the current month uh, divided by the patients who had a, a present intimate partner violence issue documented in the chart. Uh, so we looked at that percent on a monthly basis as well. So what are your thoughts on who would be best in your organization or uh, community to do follow-up? And if you have a really great idea on that, please, please share that. Um, and also, if you have questions on barriers um, and other considerations, also please type them in the Q&A box as well. All right, so here is a very simple workflow of a patient being screened in our clinic. You can also see below the clinic workflow, we had a data workflow as well. So starting with the patient presenting to the clinic, ideally they check in, um, and then the nurse will screen as part of at taking vitals. Uh, if she indicates she's experiencing abuse, the results would be communicated to either the provider, behavioral staff, health staff member, or other appropriate staff member who would then safety plan with the patient and provide additional resources. You can imagine the system can break at every point in, of the process, as you can see from the little red breaks uh, showing up. Our significant breaks were inappropriate screening, results falling through the cracks and handoff, and our resource contact information was not working, um, or the resources not being appropriate for our population. So one of the things we really had to make sure to do was once in a while call those lines to make sure they were still operational. Um, you can see the, now you can see the data workflow behind the scenes uh, where the intimate partner violence was mapped to our population health system, and that way we could have the actionable data and workflows to address IPD. 
We then programmed it to show up in our daily huddle sheet, sent a weekly list of team members to ensure all patients would have the opportunity to have a thoughtful discussion around the situation. So if the patient indicated it truly was no longer a problem, we would apply this as an exclusion in our population health system, but not our EMR. This allowed us to go back and periodically check to see if the consumer was okay, but not follow up every time they presented to our clinic, because that would not be a good practice. We also developed monthly reports to track screening improvement and positive screening that was mentioned earlier. And the message we wanted to send to our patients throughout these workflows was that they were in a safe and caring environment. So we operated in three distinct towns in our state. We are fortunate to have some good partnerships in place that we use as models to build other partnerships. It is hard to build a trusting relationship, as some of you might know, with strangers and when you're in an environment of limited funding, uh, which we definitely are in our area. But it's even harder when there's bad history involved with those partnerships. So since some of us were new to the organization, or at least didn't have a lot of prior interaction with some of the partners, going into meetings and setting a positive tone along with positive expectations was really helpful. We're able to present our program requirements and to understand it wasn't incompetence that was, caused, uh, was causing those frustrating workflows, but often external requirements or past miscommunication. We also work past the mentality that we can do everything by ourselves, which is not only illogical, uh, but not going to happen. And we realized our partnership had many benefits, including specialization and the ability to take some work off of our already overburdened staff plate. As mentioned earlier, we can get frustrated each other's workflows, but with good relationships, we can start asking why and come up with creative solutions to improve our joint workflows. We also shifted from a mentality of, I am not going to deal with that because, it is not, or because it's their job, to a mindfulness that we can improve consumers' lives by working together. We went from separate contentious silos to a well-oiled machine, and we look forward to seeing each other at community events, in fact. So one challenge that we have not been able to change in our community, unfortunately, is uh, the inavailability of housing for both populations of parents of children and our childless victims. And so we really need more funding and more attention to this significant problem. So now I'm going to pass the baton to Brian, who is going to speak about other challenges, training, and successes he has had in his organization. Thanks, Chris. And thank you all for having me. Um, I'm Brian Bickford. I'm the Director of Homeless Services for Healthcare for the Homeless Program in Worcester, Massachusetts. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, today and highlight some of the staff challenges, some of the client challenges, and some of the uh, things that we have done as a program here um, dealing with and working on supporting staff and the folks receiving services here. Um, when intimate partner violence um, situations arise. So as a healthcare for the homeless program, um, we oftentimes find ourselves in a very unique situation where we um, are not privy to some sort of information. Um, clients oftentimes come to us um, engaged in a relationship and we don't know. Um, what is actually happening. Sometimes those are intimate partner violence, domestic violence relationships. Sometimes uh, that has not started yet. So as the only health care for the homeless um, provider here in, in our city, we oftentimes find ourselves in a position where we're providing service to both um, survivors as well as perpetrators of intimate partner violence. So that's just a, an interesting, um, really unique and tough situation that we have oftentimes found ourselves in and have uh, caused us to start to really think about how do we best provide um, services to individuals and how do we provide support to our staff um, who find themselves in these situations. So some of the, the challenges that, that we find um, definitely are around primary and secondary trauma um, for staff. So that's absolutely individuals, um, staff members, uh, 
being traumatized as a result of, of seeing direct violence, um, either in their day-to-day -day work um, or seeing the aftermath um, of a situation that has happened to one of their, one of their consumers or clients, um, as well as hearing the stories that we do day in and day out. Um, sometimes feeling um, frustrated and not knowing what direction to go and how do we best support the individuals um, that we're trying to provide service to. Along with that really comes the conflict in care. Um, we provide a, a, a lot of differing services from case management um, to behavioral health and integrated primary care. We find that within our housing program, we oftentimes, um, if an intimate partner violence situation occurs in housing, it can be really tough um, to, to figure out who is providing support to who, and that there oftentimes does become a conflict, and we're right in the middle of that conflict. And so how do we support um, both individuals um, in, getting to a, a safer and better situation. So that's something that's been really tough um, and something that we've had to work really hard on on the staff side. We also um, have found that in uh, going along with the conflict of care is that how do we as staff um, provide and advocate for whoever our respective clients are? Um, that could be a perpetrator, and that could be also a survivor. And so knowing that, you know, we split care as much as we can and uh, make all of those arrangements, that we oftentimes are sitting in a meeting and trying to do our best to advocate for our respective clients. And that at times can put us at odds um, with one another. And so how do, we, how do we think about that, and how do we... Um, I'll talk a little bit in a couple more slides, but how do we provide a safe space for folks to be able to um, advocate respectfully and appropriately um, when, the, when the time is right? So next, um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about some consumer challenges or client challenges. Um, and some of these are things that that Chris and or Anna have, have highlighted, but these are some of the, um, some of what we have heard from the folks that we're providing service to. Uh, when they are involved, oftentimes a survivor of an intimate partner violence relationship, which is knowing that a lot of our folks are living on the streets and living in shelters and in unsafe situations, and knowing that, um, Oftentimes we'll hear, the devil you know. Um, I feel that I'm safer with and know what to expect from my abuser. But if I leave that situation, I might be put uh, in an even more unsafe situation. So that is, is something that we oftentimes hear and leaves, um, leaves sometimes leaves staff feeling really stuck and, and frustrated about a situation and really wanting to help and figure out how do we get you out of this unsafe situation that you're currently in, but also providing um, and help you to get into a much safer situation. As uh, we uh, folks would, I think, expect as, as intimate partner violence um, becomes more out in the open in a situation. We've definitely had situ um, times where we start to see the, the victim um, being isolated from staff. And that oftentimes is, is really scary. Um, it, I think it's an, it makes it very unsafe for the victim, but staff also. And so really thinking about how do we engage with people in the safest way um, when they're being isolated from, from staff and folks that we're trying to, to help. Um, lastly, one of the, the biggest, I think, challenges that we oftentimes um, face is that here within our community, um, there, we don't have a ton of um, domestic violence shelters. And the shelters that we do have 
oftentimes um, will not allow the individuals that we're providing service to to receive services there as a result of um, the folks that we're serving oftentimes are um, under the influence and struggling with substance dependence. So that has, has created a, a huge barrier for, for us. Um, oftentimes we know individuals are self-medicating um, to make them, to, to be able to deal with the situation that they're in and for us to kind of come up with a safety plan and then have to add a, a detox facility um, prior to ending up into some sort of shelter and not necessarily being able to plan all of those things has been a huge barrier and something that we have uh, continued to work on um, but have not really found a, a, a good outcome um, in terms of that, but something that we will continue to work on because I definitely think that is one of the largest um, barriers or challenges for the people that we serve. In terms of kind of training and supporting staff, um, just wanted to highlight a, a couple different a couple of different things. One, um, as other folks have said today, um, really remembering to use universal precautions. To and what we mean by that is is um, ask everyone is to ensure that we're really keep we're being aware, we're asking situations. complex. Provide the best service.
recognize and understand that we're all here to try to provide a, a really We've reformatted that to have staff meetings twice, twice a month, where we are, those are really the administrative times and staff support times. So we have all sorts of little fun activities and, and games, um, team building, and that sort of thing, as well as. have uh, we've created
comfortable to us um, that reflects the languages, the language and the words um, that we're most comfortable using, um, and a style that works. And sometimes we do that in a way that's not as helpful for the client. So for example, um, these are some true domestic violence screening questions, and Chris also touched on this in her presentation. So um, someone saying, no one is hurting you at home, right? And meanwhile, the partner is seated right next to the client. Or within the last year, has he ever hurt you or hit you? And this is with a nurse with her back to, you know, to the client, you know, working on the computer screen. And then asking the patient, you know, tell me more about that interaction when they're not even making, you know, eye contact or the body language isn't really open and receptive. And then the third example, I'm really sorry I have to ask you these questions. It's a requirement of our clinic. Um, so, you know, really what is the staff communicating, you know, in the way that they're asking the question? They're not necessarily open in terms of hearing that answer or they're putting assumptions. driven practice, knowing that with screening, um, we information both about healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships and also where to go should they want um, help. So, um, you know, addressing some of the barriers and looking broadly at this approach, simplifying a process of screening for and providing universal education about domestic and sexual violence for providers, first supporting staff, and I think that really gets back to the points that Brian made. Um, thinking about vicarious trauma, thinking about self-care, doing some of the work with staff, also around their own trauma and experiences with abuse, um, so that they also know what resources and help are available to them. Um, thinking also about that workplace protocol, you know, how are you going to support employees who are facing this? And then strategies for warm referral and, and support. And a warm referral is offering your patient the name and phone number of a local program. So for example, Jane you know, down the road is an advocate at safe places. You can reach her. These brochures were developed not only for clients, but also for providers. It helps to give them the words and open the conversation um, to be able to have um, this conversation with their, with their patients. We have them for multiple settings. Um, you know, they're setting specific. We also have them um, multilingual, specific to Native Americans. We have um, some new cards for LGBT and transgender um, individuals. So um, these are all free resources that we offer through our National Health Resource Center on Domestic Violence. And you can find two PDFs in the email um, that you received for this webinar just to give you a sense of what those cards look like. So we don't have that much time now, but if you could um, at some point open those cards, take a look. Um, they're, they're the size of a business card. They fold up. There's several panels. That's a strategic size so that they're easily hidden or concealed. 
um, by people um, if it's not safe for them to take that information with them. At a minimum, one thing you can offer is um, to help them memorize that national hotline on domestic violence, 1-800-799-SAFE. That's always a resource for them or um, a, a local um, number for their local program. In using this brochure-based approach, we've dubbed it Q's. And Q's um, stands for confidentiality, you know, letting them know first any limitations of confidentiality and always seeing that patient alone when you're going over this brochure with them. Um, normalizing it, doing a universal education, so saying something like, I've started giving two of these cards to all of my patients in case it's ever an issue for you because relationships can change and also so you have the info so you can help a friend or family member if it's an issue for them. That approach, that two-card approach, came out of um, a lot of um, focus group work we did and research um, you know, where we heard directly from clients about their experiences. And many clients in those groups asked for extra cards for friends or family members who needed the information that they also like being and here's the information. And the last piece of cues is support. So um, if you don't have uh, you know, that much time, you can you know, briefly walk through the card, turn it around to the back, point to the resources panel, and you know, offer and they have been um, 
helping him in his setting come in, do some education about um, the topic of domestic violence, and also just what they do, what they can offer. And that's a huge, um, that's something that really helps a lot of providers uh, take down some of the barriers in doing this work when they realize they don't need to know the A to Z of all of the support that their clients need. Advocates really know that and can help them, help their clients with that. So the way in that privacy, that one-on-one -on -one interaction, to um, provide supportive messages, those validating messages that I talked about, to help educate on the health effects of violence, how the violence they're experiencing currently or in the past may be compounding and We also have a card that's more specific to reproductive health, and that gets more at the reproductive coercion um, dynamics that you were hearing from that little video vignette. There are some harm reduction counseling um, that you can do with respect to reproductive coercion, so offering birth control that the partner doesn't have to know about, for example, IUD with the strings cut off, offering emergency contraception for them to take home, um, regular STI testing, and the availability to do STI partner notification at the clinic, that might be safer for them than doing it at home. And what we know is that for women who received this safety card intervention and had experienced recent partner violence, there was a 71% reduction in the odds of pregnancy pressure and coercion compared to the control group, and 60% more likely to end an unhealthy abusive relationship compared to the control group that did not get this intervention or the safety card. These are really important and huge outcomes. Want to become pregnant. Um, and it can be a tactic by a perpetrator to get them pregnant to keep them in that relationship. It looks similar to the slide at the beginning. Um, our National Health Resource Center on Domestic Violence provides free technical assistance and tools. So if any of this interests you, you want to learn more about it, feel free to reach out to us. We have an online toolkit.
list to really think critically about how you can incorporate um, this kind of self-care, both in terms of your own personal practice as well as within your system. And I know we want to take some Q&A questions from you, and we've heard a lot already through the chat box. So Um, even once they go to the hospital. We've um, also helped people to leave out the back door and um, go, going somewhere else if they were imminently ready to, to move out of that situation or just feared to, um, to return to the waiting room with that individual. Um, we've, you know, so, so I think it just depends on the situation um, and what, what Uh, staff comfort in assessing and screening is the most common issue they have at their clinic. Uh, do you have any suggestions for ways for staff to feel more comfortable screening? Uh, for was a lot of grumbling with that, but eventually they, beca they became more comfortable. And then there was those people that just, they weren't getting it. Somebody shared that they're struggling with a female client who is having difficulty separating herself from a, an aggressive boyfriend, and she's wondering if there's any ways that outsiders or family members can successfully intervene with this person without risk to increasing the abuse that's already happening. what people, how people are feeling and what they're telling
where they're really ready and able to do that. But it does take time. And keeping that open door, I think, is key. Not turning people away because they're not doing you know, what we want them to do, but being very respectful of their own decision making and what they think is safest and best for themselves. Great. Yeah, I was on a just being there, being present, um, and waiting for that change cycle to happen. Great. Well, thank you for joining our webinar today, everyone. Um, this webinar will be archived on our website within a few business days. A link of the archived webinar will be emailed to you once it is posted on our website. Um, at the Thanks again to our speakers, and everyone take care. Thank you.